stand for the thanksgiving for baptism. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and the word you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life, and above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Loving God, you have created us to live in loving community with one another. Form us for life that is faithful and steadfast, and teach us to trust like little children that we may reflect the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the lesson. Good morning. Welcome to worship. The first lesson for this, uh, the 19th Sunday after the Feast of Pentecost, is taken from the book of Job. There was once a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro on the earth, and from, from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin, all that people have they will give to save their lives. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, he is in your power. Only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome sores on Job from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Job took a potsherd from which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. 
Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I invite you to join me in reading the psalm responsively. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have trusted the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in faithfulness to you. I do not sit with the worthless, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the company of evildoers, and will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence, and go around your altar, O Lord. Singing aloud a song of thanksgiving, and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the house in which you dwell, and the place where your glory is Do not sweep me away with sinners, nor my life with the bloodthirsty. Those whose hands are evil devices, and whose right hands are full of pride. But as for me, I walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. The second reading is from the book of Hebrews. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact impact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels. But someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them or mortals that you care for them? You have made them a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now, in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. Word of God, word of life. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel according to Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Some Pharisees came, and to test him they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. 
Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Today I want to talk about Satan. Now, there was a time when preachers talked a lot about the devil and demons and the torments of hell, sometimes painting very elaborate pictures of those devils and torments of hell in general. That's not what I want to do today. Rather, I want to understand the place of Satan in the Bible. I think that we'll see that by doing this, uh, that we'll see that the vivid images of Satan and demons and hell are not really in the Bible at all, but all come from a later time. To begin this exploration, I need to step back and take a wider view at the concept of evil in the Bible. The language around evil in the Old Testament can be described as functional. The majority of references that are translated by the English word evil are the Hebrew word ra, or its derivatives. Ra is simply the opposite of tov, good. And most of the time, ra is used to talk about bad things happening to people or people doing bad things. So evil isn't seen as, a, as an abstract reality, as something that exists in its own right, but is seen as something that happens or is done. Evil in Hebrew is a synonym for bad or not good. In the Old Testament, God is also said to do or cause evil. For example, in Joshua 23, 15, Joshua warns the people, but just as all the good things that God promised concerning you have been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the bad things, traditionally translated as evil, until he has destroyed you from this good land that the Lord God has given you, if you transgress the covenant which the Lord God enjoined on you. The use of the word ra here is functional. It simply means in an experiential way, things or events that are hard or calamitous or life-threatening. It's not evil in any kind of personified or philosophical sense of the word. This way of thinking is summed up nicely in Isaiah 43, where it says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me there is no God. I form light and create darkness. I make weal and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. In other words, good is when good things happen or people do good or God brings about good. Evil is when bad things happen or people do bad things. God brings bad stuff upon people. If you are bad, God will bring evil on you, so be good. This is the dominant way of thinking represented in the Old Testament. Modern biblical scholars have associated this line of thought with the book of Deuteronomy, where it is laid out most clearly, and its imprint can be seen especially in the long historical narrative from Genesis to 2 Kings. And so this long recounting of Israel's history is sometimes called the Deuteronomic history. The underlying question of the Deuteronomic history seems to be, if we are God's people, then why did all this bad stuff happen to us, losing our independence and land and being led off into exile in Babylon? 
And the answer is, because we broke the covenant with God, so we'd better not break it again. However, this is not the only way of thinking represented in the Old Testament. A different approach is represented in the books of Ecclesiastes and Job. These two books note that it is not always bad people who have bad things happen to them. Often very good people suffer injustice, debilitating disease, or premature death. The response of the author of Ecclesiastes is to say that life is an insubstantial chasing after wind and that we should enjoy life while we can, understanding that we can't take it with us, and that God will judge us for our actions. The response of the book of Job is more dramatic, but also more ambiguous. The book of Job introduces us to the figure of Satan. Almost all the references to Satan in the Old Testament are in Job. The name Satan comes from a Hebrew word that means to accuse. In the, book, in the book of Job, Satan functions as a kind of loyal opposition or crown prosecutor in the heavenly court. His job is to test people to see what they're made of. As we heard in the first reading at the beginning of Job, God says to Satan that Job is the most righteous good and righteous man in the world, completely devoted to serving God. And Satan challenges God's claim about Job, saying that humans will always be loyal to someone who does them good. He says that God, and this is at the very beginning, the first time, the one we heard was the second time around, at the very beginning that God has made Job rich, given him lots of children, and thus evoked a lot of honor for him in his community Take all that away, Satan says to God, and Job will curse you to your face. So God grants Satan permission to take it all away. And then we heard the second one where then it has to do with the health, the physical health. And so when Job sits suffering the loss of all his riches and family, except his wife, and plagued by oozing and scabbing sores all over his body, and his wife suggests that he might as well curse God and die, he responds with words that echo the Deuteronomist. He says, Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? At the same time, Job is troubled because he cannot figure out why God is punishing him. The rest of the book explores the underlying problem with the assumption that when evil happens, it must be a punishment from God. The upshot of the book is that evil or bad stuff happening to a person may be a kind of test, or it may just be beyond our understanding. By our modern standards, God is left looking a tad callous, Nevertheless, there is a shift in the book from the Deuteronomic idea that the bad things that happen to us are God's punishment to a worldview in which Satan, operating somewhat independently of God, brings suffering in the form of testing, especially among the faithful. Interestingly, Ecclesiastes echoes this with the statement, do not be too righteous and do not act too wise. Why? should you destroy yourself. Fast forward 500 years to the time of the New Testament, and we see that there has been a notable shift in people's thinking about good and evil. While Satan still is playing the role of accuser or tester, as we see uh, in the uh, temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, Satan is now also called hodiabolos, the devil, from a Greek root that means to slander, so the slanderer. And we read about entities called daimon and daimonion, from which we get our word demon. These demons are said to go into people, possess them, and cause physical and mental illness. Much of Jesus' ministry consisted of casting out these demons. The New Testament builds on traditions 
that had emerged during that 500 year period between the Babylonian exile and the time of Jesus. And one of the most notable writings of this time, of this intertestamental period, is the Book of Enoch. We don't hear about this book very much today, but at the time of the writing of the New Testament, it had enough panache among Christians to get quoted in Jude. Various recensions of Enoch have come down to us through the Eastern and Oriental Orthodox churches. In chapter 18 of the Slavonic version of Enoch, also called Second Enoch, we find the description of heavenly beings, watchers, as they're called in the book, who, with their prince Satanael, rejected the Lord of Light and befouled the earth with their deeds, who in all times of their age made lawlessness, and therefore God judged them with great judgment, and they will be punished on the Lord's great day. And this is clearly an elaboration of Genesis 6-4, where it says, the Nephilim were on earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God went into the daughters of Adam who bore children to them. These were the heroes of old, warriors of renown. It is possible that in this reimagining in Enoch of a moment in Genesis, we see the origin of the image of Satan as a fallen angel who rebelled against God and who took many other angels with him to become his minions. And we also see the setup here for the passage in Revelation where it says, And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they were tormented day and night forever and ever. But that's the end of the story. So, so let's go back to what we might call our current situation. In Ephesians 6.12, we read that our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It is assumed here that there exist numerous spiritual powers whose aim it is to draw people away from God. In Revelation, there is a verse with the words, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan. This brief comment makes a link between Satan and the serpent who deceived the man and the woman in the garden. And I find it interesting that all this, this link between Satan and the serpent in the Garden of Eden is very weak in the Bible. Just a few words in one verse. It has become strong in popular thinking. That's how ideas evolve over centuries. From the oldest layers of the Old Testament to the end of the New Testament, we see a shift from a view in which God is the source of all, both good and bad, and that we have no choice but to submit to God and seek God's favor, to a view which sees forces at work in the world that trouble and torment people with illness, and disaster and other evils in order to drive a wedge between God and people. And so today in our orders of baptism and affirmation of baptism, the pastor asks the question, do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? To which we answer, I renounce them. But right after this, these orders have two more questions that call for the same response. Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? And do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? I renounce them. I renounce them. These questions reflect the understanding that there are, there are three things that pull us away from God, namely ourselves, our circumstances, and things that test our faith. Or to put it more traditionally, the world the flesh, and the devil. So the picture in the Bible around what causes evil is inconsistent. It embodies centuries of development of how people tried to make sense of the bad things that happened to them and what the uh, something was that seemed to be pulling them away from God. A lot of what we associate with Satan and the devil is not in the Bible at all. Horns and pitchforks and a fiery underworld. 
but reflects the coming together of European folk tradition and the imaginations of monks and bishops and artists over many centuries, picking up bits and pieces from the Bible, linking them together, blending them with other stuff. You can imagine like a blender, right? Just kind of put it all in. Zzz, to create a grand picture that found its most eloquent expression in Dante's Divine Comedy. Of course, it didn't help that the medieval church turned some of this folk tradition into official doctrine. In the Reformation, there was a desire to shed all the teachings that weren't biblical. And officially, that is what Protestantism did. But you know, people don't like ambiguity. Let's face it. The incomplete and inconsistent picture of Satan and demons as presented in the Bible just can't compete in people's imaginations with the more Hollywood-esque Satan of medieval mythology. This is why I think it's important to remember that whenever we are talking about God or spiritual we are touching on matters beyond ordinary human understanding. Because we are talking about the, the invisible and the transcendent, we are forced to use images from ordinary life as, as poetic images or as metaphors to make that world more accessible and at least somewhat understandable. The danger is when we turn around and take those metaphorical images and treat them as literal images and then, then let our imaginations run away on us. In other words, Satan as the accuser and the devil as the slanderer may simply be a poetic way of saying the stuff that's happening right now in my life is really testing my faith. And that's why I think it's important to stay focused on the main thing. As Paul writes, I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
Please stand and let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for the prayer. I invite you to join me as together we pray for all people according to their needs. I will end each petition with the words, Lord, in your mercy, to which the response is, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, source of all that is, through the cross of Jesus Christ, you have called us to be your people in the world, to overcome fear and hatred, and to break down barriers that divide. Give to your church the self-honesty and the courage we need to fulfill your purpose for us, that we might be agents of reconciliation, especially as we seek pathways of reconciliation with the First Nations people of our land. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, source of all that is, as our Synod prepares to meet in convention, to give thanks for your presence among us and to plan our future mission and ministry. We give you thanks for the ministry of our Bishop Greg Moore and pray for wisdom and discernment as we go through the process of electing a new Bishop to lead our Synod. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, source of all that is. You have made all people stewards of this planet, which you have given us to be our home. Give wisdom to our world's political leaders as they prepare to meet in Glasgow for environmental, environmental talks. Help us to care for and tend what you have entrusted to us and to return it to you whole and well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, source of all that is, the physical forces of the universe and of this world are so much larger and more powerful than we. And sometimes they overwhelm us and remind us of our fragility. When this happens, Remind us that we are called to help where there is need and to be a blessing for all. And especially we pray that you would be uh, with all health care workers who serve the public good in the midst of this COVID pandemic. Lord, of, Lord in your mercy, hear. hear our prayer. Holy God, source of all that is, we pray for all who are ill or suffering in any way and name them before you now, either out loud or in the quiet of our hearts. For Fred. For all these, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, source of all that is, we bless you for the lives of all your faithful people through whom you have revealed your love for the world and the people you have made. Help us not to worry for what may come, but to entrust all things to you. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. Holy God, source of all that is, gather these concerns and all who are in need into your abundant grace. Remembering your promises of mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. The Lord bless you and